Well, welcome everybody. Such an interesting subject. No wonder we have so many people here. Because we're all old and we will be there at some point. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little bit about Michelle, and she'll tell you about what she does. But um, I have to read this. So Michelle Hugol Achavati, right? Did I get it right? Is a natural death care worker and founder of the Vermont Forest Cemetery, the first natural buried ground, burial ground in Vermont, uh, which is in Roxbury, in you said? Roxbury. Yes. Um, she's a licensed funeral director, death doula, pregnancy loss guide, home funeral guide, end of life specialist, and natural burial educator. In 2016, Michelle created Green Mountain Funeral Alternatives. She has practiced death work with people of all ages, including death during pregnancy. Her work has found her, uh, I can't read my own writing, found her <laughs> in settings as varied as the forest, Boston Children's Hospital, and in living rooms, as well as traditional funeral homes. Welcome, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Hello, everybody. Um, I've done some stuff in and around Montpelier before. Have any of you seen me give a talk before? <laughs> All right, OK, so good. I don't need to worry about repeating myself then. Um, or contra well, I, I, might, I might do that. Um, you'll catch me out if I do. So um, what's going to happen today is uh, when we were getting the cemetery started, I got a call from a, a senior at Ithaca College, which has a really good documentary filmmaking program. And so there was a group of seniors that, for their senior project, needed to make a short documentary. And I am a death doula, and his this this guy, his name is Max, his aunt had taken a training that I teach in, and he reached out to me and he thought that maybe they would make their documentary about dying in America and they wanted to interview me as a death doula. And I said, well, that's really interesting, but what I'm doing right now is about to start the first natural burial ground in Vermont, and maybe you'd want to cover that story instead. And they did, and so this group of four students, it's about seven hours back and forth from Roxbury to Ithaca, came out num numerous times. They actually helped us build our trails, um, <laughs> which everything was happening in September. We opened in October of 2023. Um, and they got permission to film um, our first burial. So I'm gonna start by showing you, this is a short documentary. Uh, so it's 20 minutes long, and this is, it features a little bit of information about natural burial. It features our opening last year, as well as um, our, the very first burial that took place. And Ithaca, New York, also has the third oldest natural burial ground in the United States called Green Springs. And so I sent these students there as well. So there's a parallel story of a woman in Ithaca picking her spot at Green Springs Cemetery. So you're going to see two cemeteries and hear things from different perspectives. After that, I'm going to just take your questions. So. Um, and I'll answer them as best I can. You don't have to memorize anything that I say. Everything is on our website, and I do have, I did not expect this many people here, so there's not enough for all of you, but there are, there's some brochures up here, there's uh, a map that you can look at, there's a whole bunch of stuff here for you. And, um, and I will say this, we are a nonprofit cemetery, so if you're inspired to leave us a donation, you can as well. We're very grateful for that, but no obligation. I hate talking about money, so there we go. I have a tendency to get really excited about what I'm talking about, which means I speak slowly and, uh, or rather quickly and softly. <laughs> if you need me to slow down or speak up, even with the microphone, please just wave your hand like this. I'll know what it means and I will slow myself down for you. Um, it really, it, I've had people come up to me after talks and told me that they couldn't understand a thing I was saying because I was going so quickly. Please let me know in the middle of what's happening so I can adjust for you. It is just that this is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so I want to be mindful of everybody's time. This is a nice big group. I want to let anybody that's coming in get a chance to get settled, but... Um, Can you see the screen from there? No, no, I have to leave early, so that's why I'm not gonna... Do you wanna, you can just walk across everybody. You won't, you won't walk, okay, all right. So, um, ah. So, 
So it's been a year since we opened. We have done 21 burials so far and sold almost 80 graves to people. And um, before I take your questions, I, I want to answer a question that, that I get asked a lot, which is why? Why do I do this? Um, and I think the documentary speaks for itself. Um, there's two things that I want to call attention to. One is there's a moment where the little one, Finn, he was four, he reaches down to touch his grandfather's body at the graveside. And um, he came out after his uncles had carried his father's body to the grave and he saw his, his grandfather's body on the gravesite. and he looks at his dad and he goes, is that grandpa? And his dad goes, yeah. And he goes, can I touch him? And his dad goes, no. <laughs> and I said, you know, he can. If it's okay with you, he can. There's nothing wrong with it. And so he came over and he knelt down and he touched his, his grandfather's body. And then he got up and he picked up a stick and he started hitting a tree. Because he's four. That's all that he needed to be in that moment with him. But what you don't see in the documentary is one of his... I've got a red light on the microphone. Let's see, but it's working. All right. So his uncle had helped carry his, his, this is, his uncle's carrying his father's body, his father's body to the grave. And then he stepped away from the gravesite. And he was really far away from the gravesite. And he watched his little nephew come over and touch his father's body. And he came over and he went almost tired of the rest of the burial service with his hand on his dad's heart. So. When people ask me why I do this, it's because, in a way, grief is an emotion that demands action. And when I worked at the conventional funeral home here in Montpelier, I took away all of people's agency when they came to me after death. I did everything. And this gives people an opportunity to move through their grief. Um, the family of our 13th burial was a, a young man that had died. And his brother came to me afterwards, and he said, I think when Sean chose this, Sean was teaching us how to grieve. So that's why I do this. Um, and now I will take your questions. Yes? What is, what's the capacity of the, uh, the cemetery up there? In yeah. So the question is, what's the capacity of the cemetery? So we have 56.2 acres of forest. About 30 of those are variable. We have opened about 12 of them with trail systems in the year that we have been open. The rule of thumb for natural burial is you want to do about 100 burials per acre. Our bodies are a lot of carbon. We don't want to overwhelm an ecosystem. This is also why you saw they put green matter in the grave, right? We're doing that. Anybody who composts, right? We want to balance out all that carbon. Um, so we're competing with trees and land features and other things. So you know, can we do 100 bodies burials per acre? Not quite, uh, but if we're being quite conservative, we can do about 3,000 burials um, at the site. Yes? I have friends who bury miles from here. How the body is prepared takes some time coordination. So the question is about preparing a body for natural burial, time, and distance. You know, to get to, to our cemeteries in Roxbury. How many people know where Roxbury, Vermont is? Oh, awesome. OK. It's been in the news a lot here in Montpelier with the school merger. I go other places, and people have no idea. But it is the geographic center of Vermont is in Roxbury. So the United States is one of the only countries in the world that preferentially embalms its dead. Um, most countries have not resorted to this as a practice. And natural burial is, in of itself, a partnership between the body and the soil. The very first stage of decomposition happens internally. The guts, the, the bacteria in our guts that help us digest food are what begins to break our body down from the inside. And then we offer that body to the soil where there's microorganisms and heat and oxygen come into play. And they do the rest of the practice of breaking our body back down into the nutrients, which are taken up by the root structures and redistributed back into the forest. We want to have that process happen, but we don't want to have it happen right away. So embalming renders the body aseptic. It's irreversible. People worry about embalming because formaldehyde is a rather nasty chemical. 
but it's more of a risk to living people than it is to soil. Formaldehyde is organic, same as chemotherapy drugs or antidepressants or hormones. These things break down in soil along with the body. So we don't allow embalming, but not because it's bad for the planet, but because it makes that partnership between the planet and the body harder. So how do we preserve a body prior to burial? We cool it. This is a heat dependent process. If we bring the body down to close to 40 degrees, that bacteria quiets down and those early stages of decomposition are delayed until the burial can take place. So we do most of our burials about five days after death. Um, we have gone as long as two weeks when refrigeration is available. And for people that are interested, this is not necessary, but you can lay out your bed at home. Allen Ginsberg's body was preserved with frozen peas. Um, there are better products than what you can find in your freezer, but I also know of somebody recently where the person died unexpectedly and they didn't have any of the ice ready that they needed, and they started with frozen pizza until they could get down to the convenience store and get more ice that they needed. So anything that keeps the body cool will work. Um, there are also funeral homes in and around Vermont that have started using mortuary coolers, so you can partner with a funeral home if you don't want to keep the body at home yourself and keep it cool with ice. A, a funeral home can keep it cool. So that's the first stage. You prepare the body, it's bathed, it's cooled, and then it's transported to the cemetery. So no matter what the distance is, no matter what state you're starting in, you do have the right to transport your own dead in Vermont, or again, you can work with a funeral director to do that part. Does that answer your question and then some? <laughs> yes, all right. Yes. I mean, it's hard to live in Vermont and not worry about flooding, but we are about 1,800 feet up. Um, there's a river on our property that is the northernmost headwaters of the White River, as it's the third branch of the White River. Um, it's very small. Um, even with the, all the rain that we had uh, last year, we didn't have any worries about flooding. We occasionally have some flash flooding in smaller streams. But we don't worry about flooding disrupting grave sites. So how many of you were here in Vermont for Irene? Yes, okay, and did you see the images, particularly out of Rochester, Vermont, where there were caskets that were actually, yeah. yep. So that happens because of the decomposition process that is different from what happens in natural burial. Natural burial is an aerobic process, okay? But anaerobic process causes different things to happen. Caskets are actually buoyant, and if you get enough water into the grave in this place, they can be dislodged from the soil. We don't have that worry. So even if we were to have a flooding event at the cemetery, it would not dislodge bodies from grave sites. But I will say at this point, if there was a flooding event that would significantly cause there to be water in our cemetery, given the slope and our elevation and the very small amount of water that we have moving through the cemetery, I think we would all be worried about something much more than what was happening to the dead that are buried at our cemetery. This would make any of the flooding events that we've had so far look like child's play. So it's on our mind, and I will say just to this, is that one thing that we have learned is that healthy soil is more absorbent. As a state, we are questioning, what do we do about flooding? Do we reroute our roads here in Montpelier? Do we reroute all, of, do we replace Montpelier? Do we move it up to the top of the hill? What do we do? One of the things that we all can do is make our soil healthier. So one of the things that we're attempting to model at our cemetery is if we can rebuild soil health, we can improve the sponginess of soils, and we can actually serve as a flood mitigation risk for towns that are downstream from us. And this is something that we hope to model for the state. There is an awful lot of conserved land in this state, whether through current use or our state forest system, and it is left to do what it will. And our entire state was logged and deforested. Our soils are, depacted, are severely compacted. Before logging, it was farmed, so their nutrients are depleted. The more healthy we make the soils in our forests, the more our forests will be able to take the water pressure away from our communities. So this is something we're actively designing experiments with. We have a group of students at South Burlington High School that are gonna do some of the original work. And we're also working with Dee Dee Pursehouse, who is a soil sponge expert on designing more elaborate and in-depth experiments to answer that question. Yes. Yes. So the questions are about grave depth and, and when, if you donate your body for medical research, can you have a natural burial? 
If I forget one, remind me. So the question is about burial depth. And so you had heard 18 inches. So 18 inches is the amount of soil that you want on top of the body. When, uh, when I moved to Vermont in 2014, Vermont was one of three states in the country that had a mandatory minimum burial depth. This meant we had to bury our dead at a depth of at least five feet. Why? Well, Vermont was also one of the few states in the country that had a vault manufacturing business here. Vaults are the concrete boxes that go into almost every grave in this state. They were invented to prevent grave robbing. This has not been a problem since the 1930s. Um, because people donate their bodies now to, to medical research, we have a nice supply of cadavers coming in. We do not need to dig them up from people's graves. But they've remained in use because they make cemetery maintenance much easier. So I can't prove this, but I believe the law went onto the books to accommodate facilitating cemeteries being able to use vaults. Therefore, we got stuck with this idea that we had to do our burials at five feet. I had a lot of fun moving around the state house, asking various legislators if they wanted to talk about the role of burial depth <laughs> and natural burial, especially at lunchtime. I was very popular. Um, but I did that because in 2015, a group of citizens, and is Mary Alice here? No, one of Mary Alice Bisbee is one of them, so she's here, had actually gone through and, and legalized uh, not most of the natural burial pieces, but left out this burial depth piece. So I had to, to do that last part. Um, so what we did is we changed the rule to three and a half feet. So I am exactly five feet tall. This is three and a half feet deep. Okay? It's much deeper than you think it is. But what that allows us to do is place two, 18, 18 to 24 inches, about two feet of soil, on top of the body. The reason for this is that that creates both a physical and a chemical barrier for scavengers. Right? So just as formaldehyde and chemotherapy drugs and all these things are broken down by soil, the smells that attract scavengers to grave sites are also organic. So if we have sufficient soil on top of the body, those smells are broken down before they reach the surface. Scavengers do not know that there is a grave there to dig up. Also, most scavengers are also prey animals. Even coyotes are worried about getting eaten by something. They do not work hard for their meals. We are a, severely, a very forested state. There are plenty of things that die right on the surface of the forest for scavengers to eat. They are not going to dig down th the two feet to get to a body. Um, now, animal disturbance is not always something that we can avoid. So for example, this spring, we had a fisher cat uh, who all winter had spent its uh, winter climbing up over the mound of a grave and sliding down on the other side in the snow. I don't tend to think of something that preferentially eats porcupines as being playful, but apparently fisher cats are known for this. They also love to den in the spring under deadfall with nice, loosely turned soil. And that is pretty much what you get at the top of a natural burial grave. It dug about eight inches down, nowhere near the, the body at all, and created a little den. I contacted the widow of the gentleman that was buried in this particular site, and I asked her what she thought. And she said, oh, it's the cycle of life. I hope it has babies. <laughs> So we left it. It did not have babies. It is one of the graves that we show regularly when we do tours of the cemetery. I think it decided that was just too many people and it moved on. But in terms of animal disturbance, you do occasionally see things like that. You will see skunks rooting around in the freshly turned soil for grubs and things like that, but nothing that endangers the body or the integrity of the grave. So that's the burial depth question. If you donate your body to science, if it goes to a university, it goes to a medical school program. And I was once one of these people that benefited from this donation. Thank you. It is incredibly generous, and it really helps us. However, those bodies are re returned to families as ashes because of the work that is done to them while they are being used by the students and for research. So they're not returned as whole, intact bodies. We do accept the uh, burial of cremated remains at our cemetery. About 80% of Vermonters are currently choosing cremation. A lot of Vermonters were practical people, right? We don't like to spend money on things that we don't need to spend money on, and we don't like to create problems for our families if we don't need to. Cremation is a very, very simple solution to these things. However, ashes after cremation, that process is so hot, all the nutrients are locked into the bone, and they have a pH of about 11.4. So what do we do? 
We bury those ashes at a depth of at least four feet where we're down closer to the bedrock and we're far away from the root structure so it can't cause any damage. We do have a scattering area, but we ask that people only scatter about a tablespoon, a symbolic amount of ashes in order to protect the, the, the growing things on the surface of the forest. So you can be buried. Please don't change your mind if you're donating <laughs> your body to science. We will take it and you will have it. We just did an urn burial um, and it's, it's a beautiful and it's a wonderful process. We are working with a compost expert to see if there's a way that we can amend ashes to help lower the pH and potentially make the nutrients that are still in those bones biologically available to the soils. So in time, hopefully, your ashes will even allow your nutrients to return and, su and support the forest as well. Yes. Here at Green Mount. Yep. So at Green Mount, there's going to do it. So in those instances, are families going through a funeral parlor? Or are they taking charge of this themselves? What typically happens? So this is a question about when natural burial takes place at a conventional cemetery. And I will say, so Pat started out at Green Mount Cemetery as one of my largest detractors. He was a thorn in my side for years. He was finally won over. So Green Mount also now has a natural burial section. There's about a dozen to 15 cemeteries that offer natural burial. So in that case, our families working with funeral directors are they doing things on their own. It is up to the family. There are no rules at any of these cemeteries. As long as the body arrives at the cemetery in a way that's fitting with the rules for burial, whether it's, you know, some of them do require uh, pine boxes, they won't do shroud burials. So it's just little bylaws, things like that, that people need to work with. But in terms of whether or not you work with a funeral director, what are the pros and cons of this? So the pros are there's somebody to do it for you. Right, this is something, it takes something off of your hands. Um, somebody that knows what they're doing, bathes the body, prepares the body, stores the body, fills out all the paperwork for you, and brings the body to the cemetery. Grief brain is a bit like toddler brain. It is really hard to focus on anything. It is hard to complete tasks, and it is a lot to ask the people that we love to take care of the logistics of what happens after death, and that's what funeral directors do. What are the cons? The cost, unfortunately. Um, and the other is, again, like I said, grief is an emotion that demands action. 150 years ago, there was no professional funeral industry, right? We did care for our own dead. This was something that we did, but we did it in community. And so something that we're hoping to restore to Vermont is a community of people that help lay out the dead so that this is not the responsibility of the family to figure out. So I am constantly working with people that are interested in this to train them in how to lay out the dead after death care. More and more hospice nurses are offering these services to families. Even if you don't keep the body at home, this allows you the opportunity to spend some time and confront the reality of death. And if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you a story as to why I think this is so important. So when I worked at Guerre's here in Montpelier, uh, a gentleman came in. He and his wife had been married for almost 70 years. Okay, this is a long marriage. He was devastated. He, uh, they, his, her, his wife's wishes, his wishes for his wife was that her body was embalmed, so I embalmed her. He came to the funeral home to see her. He looked at me and he said, she looks so good, I could take her home with me. But where we were going next was the cemetery. He was not ready for me to close that casket and take her to the cemetery and bury her. He was not ready to see her one last time because I had made her look as alive as possible. That is the goal of embalming. It is the lie that we tell at funerals that, oh, it looks just like them. It can't. What makes us us is our soul, our spark, our vitality, whatever it is that you believe, but that is what leaves when we die. When we take that away from people, we make it very hard to integrate the reality that death has occurred. Contrast with this, last year, my aunt, I'm gonna try to get through this without crying, but lately I've been crying <laughs> a lot about it. My aunt was diagnosed with a glioblastoma just before Christmas, and we, it's a brain tumor, and we buried her on Earth Day. Um, she was my, one of my first planning clients, and her wish was to be laid out at home the way her grandmother had been. As she was dying, my uncle came to me, and he was very involved with her care. I mean, he was attentive, he was wonderful. But he said, look, when she dies, she'll just be a body. And a body is a body, and I just don't think I want it in the house. Do you have to lay her out here? And I said, no, I, I can do everything that she wants 
in, in a funeral home. It doesn't need to be here in the home. She died at one in the morning, and he called me, and he said, she's gone. I'm holding her hand, and I don't want to let go. And I said, you don't have to. A couple hours later, he called and he said hospice had come out and certified the death and he was ready for me to come and I came. The sun was rising and um, we sat for a while with her body and he took her hand and he looks at me and he goes, do you think your parents could bring breakfast? <laughs> and I said, sure, they're probably not awake yet. Um, <laughs> But a, a little while later, we called them, and they brought breakfast over. And sure enough, he was never ready for her to leave. We had breakfast. We laid her out at home. We did everything that she wanted right there in the bed where she died. It was a hospital bed. He had pulled up a trundle bed next to her so they could still sleep next to each other. He spent that night sleeping next to her body. The next day, he said, I'm ready, which was good, because that was the day we were going to the cemetery. But I offer that to people in terms of, is it very different from what we're used to? Yes. Does it feel strange? Is it overwhelming for family members? It can be. But it is an incredible gift to give yourself a little bit of time to be with the body of somebody that you loved. Because it is the last time you will be with their physical presence and the work of mourners, the task that we all have when somebody dies, is to come into a relationship with somebody as memory and as spirit. And we can't do that until we're ready to say goodbye to their physical body. And time is the greatest thing we can give ourselves for that, even if it's just a few hours. Yes, Juanita. Do you still need a permit to transport bodies? You do. Where do you go for that? So paperwork after death. To care for a body, or really to transport a body any place, you need two pieces of paper. One is the death certificate. This is the legal record that somebody has died. And the other is the burial transit permit. And this is basically a body's permission slip to move around the state. And what it does is it informs the state of where the burial has taken place, because the state requires that we keep track of where the bodies are buried. So for those of you that are thinking this is a natural process, why dig the hole at all? Just leave me out in the forest for the coyotes to take. We can't do that. The state has rules. Sorry. Um, it also might be hard for your loved ones. Just to think about that. So a funeral director can get that paperwork for you. You can get that paperwork for yourself. If anybody is interested in doing this for themselves, I offer I, consulting services. I can talk you through this. What I offer my clients is a step-by-step -step plan that from the time of dying to the time of burial, everything that needs to take place, who needs to get called when, what do you need to do, how do you get the paperwork that you need. And that goes into your folder of things that you give the people that love you so that they know exactly what to do. Whether or not you're going to be buried on your own property at Vermont Forest Cemetery or in one of the other cemeteries in Vermont that offers this, or if you're going to be cremated. Um, so that's something to offer. But just the short answer, how do you get the paperwork? You do it with your town clerk or your city clerk. Yes? What if you travel across state So in Vermont, the rules are that families can act as their own funeral directors. So if you're starting in Vermont, it depends on what the rules are in the state that you're going to. But if you're starting in another state and you're coming to Vermont, as long as you have that piece of paper and you have an appropriate vehicle, you can transport across state lines. Yep. The death, and the, the death certificate and the burial transit permit. You need the death certificate to get the burial transit permit. So, Thank you. yes. So again, this is something where the details, it, this is something that it's, it's, it's easy but not simple. There's like a lot of little logistical details. And again, I can work with people to answer all of them. But the overview of if to be buried on your own property, you have to own the land outright. You can't have it mortgaged. You have to meet statutory siting guidelines that are set out by the state. You have to establish what's called a family burial ground. And in theory, this means that your cemetery on your own property is restricted to your immediate family members only. Now, this is overseen by the town or city clerk in whatever town you're in. So they do occasionally make exceptions for people around, around this. But the other thing to think about is properties often change hands. It's unlikely that things are going to stay in the same family for generations anymore. So when you site your natural burial ground on your own property, be thoughtful about what might happen if the property changes hands. Um, there's a story that I tell of a woman. She was young when her husband died. She buried him right outside the kitchen window. 
She eventually had to sell the house. She couldn't stand the idea of anyone else looking out that kitchen window at her husband's body, so she insisted on having him disinterred and reburied. It was not a pleasant process for anybody. So to be mindful of where you bury so that if you need to come back from somewhere else to visit the gravesite, you're not walking right by the house. And whoever buys the house after you maybe isn't looking out at that gravesite from the windows or watching you come and visit the grave whenever you come. And you can do this by creating an easement when you create the family cemetery on your own property. So just sort of short answer to that. Yep. Yes. So Vermont Forest Cemetery, we run like a park. So it is open from dawn to dusk, 365 days a year. We don't keep every trail open in the winter, just the main trails. And there's a map up here. Please don't take it. It's the only copy of that I had. I thought I brought more. Um, but you can look at it, and I can, if people are curious as to where you can go. We've had snowshoe groups and cross-country skiers come in the winter, though, so that works as well. Um, but anybody's welcome to come. The other thing that we offer is we offer people the opportunity to come and witness a burial. So whether or not, so Ron, the, the gentleman that we buried, he had four strapping sons, okay? <laughs> he didn't have any concerns or his family didn't have any concerns about who was gonna carry his body to the gravesite, who was gonna fill that grave in. It was all in the family. I'm not that lucky. Most of us in Vermont are not that lucky to live in community that's intergenerational, that has nice, healthy young people there to do this work for us. So we provide a core of volunteers. Some of them do the physical labor on behalf of the family. The rest are there to witness and hold space. So if you're curious about what a burial looks like, I have a sign-up sheet here. If you check the box that I want to volunteer, we'll put you on a list, and you're welcome to come and be a part of a burial. We might ask you to maybe hold some flowers, um, or something like that, but we're not going to ask too much of anybody. If you do want to be a part of the work, you can be a part of the work as well, but that opportunity is there for people as well. Yes? What is the difference between green burial and, and natural burial? So what is the difference between green burial and natural burial? Semantics. Um, I use natural burial just because green is a term that gets thrown around a lot. It's become more commercial and increasingly meaningless. I use natural just because it stays away from some of those commercial connotations and encapsulates a bit of what we do. There is an organization called the Green Burial Council, um, which is also the Conservation Burial Council, and they define, there's definitions for cemeteries, so a, a hybrid cemetery is one like at Greenmount or uh, Robinson Cemetery in Callis, where they do conventional burials and then they have natural burials in place. There, the difference between a natural and a conservation burial ground is whether or not the cemetery has a partnership with a conservation group. So we are a conservation cemetery that does natural burial, just to confuse the semantics a little bit. But our conservation partner is the White River Natural Resources Conservation District. So, yes. So the question is, do we do winter burials? Yes, we do burials year round. Um, last winter was not a problem. The ground never froze. Uh, 2014 was the first winter I had in Vermont. You may remember that winter. We had very little snow, and it was very cold, and the frost line was five to six feet deep. Uh, one of the first things that happened to me in my house was our pipes froze. That was fun. Um, <laughs> luckily, nothing burst. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in the situation that we had a winter like that, um, we dug our first four graves by hand. It turns out Roxbury is very well named. There are lots of rocks in the soil. Um, we do have a mini excavator now. It's my size. It's my best friend. Um, but so that has been sufficient so far. We do have a jackhammer attachment if we need to break the frost line down. The bigger problem for us has been mud season. Um, last year we had mud season in December and January. Uh, we kind of skipped it in February, but then most of March and all of April was just one big long mud season. Um, the dangers with that are, is just making sure people can get to the cemetery safely. If we need to delay the burial, I don't anticipate it being more than a couple of weeks in mud season, um, and we work with funeral homes that have refrigeration that would store the body for that time, and we would ask people to come when it's safe. Basically, our mantra at the cemetery is, as long as it's not illegal, impossible, or unsafe, we're gonna find a way to do it for you. So the very few times that we ask you <laughs> to, to maybe delay or hold off, it is really because it is what's best for everybody involved but we do burials. We don't do burials 365 days a year. We take a couple of days off here and there, but we do burials year round. Yes. Um, is a grave marked in any way with a person's name? And over time, does nature overtake the grave so it disappears? 
So the question is, is, are the graves marked? And what does nature do to the grave sites? So grave markings are up to the family themselves. Uh, Kate, Ron's widow, so Ron was a carpenter, uh, among many other things. She took a piece of wood from a project, which she said he, one of his many finished projects that he'd left around the house, and she took a wood burning tool and, and put his name and dates, and that song, that tune that she's playing is a tune that she wrote for their fifth wedding anniversary on the mandolin, so the notes to that tune are on his marker, and everybody that was present at his burial signed it. That is the only marker so far that people have chosen of the 21 burial sites that we've had. That does not mean graves remain unmarked. So we have one where the family put in, actually two now, where the family have put in a fire pit next to the grave site, and one where the family regularly comes and has small fires while they sit next to um, their wife and mom are the people that are coming. Um, and, um, but one story, so we buried a 97-year-old woman, it was our third burial, and um, she voluntarily stopped eating and drinking at the end of her life. She read mystery novels as she was dying, which I, I was like, what happens if you die before you finish? She goes, I'll never know. Um, I asked her if she wanted a marker and she said, don't limit me. Every tree in the forest will be my marker. Unless you can mark every tree, I don't want one. And so she doesn't have one at all. Uh, we have a family where the young woman that died loved to uh, care for baby birds. So they're building a birdhouse at her grave site. Um, and the urn burial that we just did was for a woman that used to keep sheep and her family felted a little woolen sheep and that's sitting right there on top of her grave and over time that will disintegrate and go back. And the other marker that we have is somebody is interested in adopting our privy and her husband was a ceramicist and she wants to fill the privy with ceramic tiles that his students made in his honor and so it will be John's John. <laughs> If, if my board approves of it, but raise your hand. Should my board approve of this? Yes, yes, I think so, okay. Um, <laughs> my next board meeting's in two weeks, so we'll see how that goes. Um, the other question is what happens to grave sites after burial? We allow them to rewild. Um, the majority of our grave sites have been overtaken by ferns this year. And fun fact, those ferns are still really green, whereas all the rest of the ferns in the forest have started to succumb. Now, I don't know, we had a, we had a frost warning last night. I wasn't there today, so maybe they did finally give in. But um, And we don't maintain, so we maintain the trails. We don't maintain individual trails to grave sites. But if your family wants to know, you know, it lets us know that they're coming, we can help open it up. And for people that don't choose a marker, or people that do, we do also mark the graves in a couple of ways. So one is we bury a bronze pin at every grave site, and that's stamped with identifying information. It's buried, you can't see it, but we can find it with a metal detector. Um, every grave site is also recorded on our map. It has survey coordinates. That gets recorded in our records and with the town of Roxbury. Um, we hope to do this with GPS, um, but it turns out in the mountains and in the woods, GPS is just not reliable enough. Uh, so we do it by survey coordinates, and we can give people turn-by-turn -turn directions to any grave site. Um, so we don't lose people. Yes? At some point, do you want to reuse those sites? I love this question. So grave reuse. So the United States, in addition to being one of the few countries that embalms its dead, is also one of the few countries that treats your gravesite like your forever home. I've heard it referred to, for some people, it's the only piece of property you're going to own. I hate, I hate to break it for you, you don't actually own your grave, it's a lease. Um, <laughs> most other countries in the world reuse gravesites. Um, and the United States is starting to grapple with this because it turns out we're running out of space too. Um, so we are very interested in doing this at the cemetery. We would never do this for a family that is not interested in having their grave reused. But if you do want your grave reused, absolutely, we're looking into that. So White River Natural Resources Conservation District also does animal disposition. They are going to uh, give us some pig carcasses, which we will bury, and we will look at what is an appropriate amount of time before we can reopen a grave and let it be used again. But for people that want their grave to just be in continuous use, we're going to figure out what that timeline is, and we're going to figure out how we keep those records as well. Um, because if there's multiple people in one site, again, the state makes us keep track of all of that. So exactly how we note all that down, we'll figure out. And once we've got all that data in hand, we'll make that an option for people that are buried here. In the back.
Yeah. So the question is about buying graves. So we are a nonprofit, which means if you buy your grave in advance, you're, that helps us run the cemetery. Everything that we have done in our first year of, of uh, operation, with the exception of the fundraiser that we just completed, um, has mostly come through lot sales, the excavator, all of the tools, all the new equipment. So you can buy your grave in advance. It is incredibly helpful for us to do so. And I hate to sound like a used car salesman, but chances are this is the least expensive it's going to be, and prices are only going to go up <laughs> over time. Um, come on down. Um, but I can't, I, I can't tell you we're running out of space or there's any need for you to rush to buy your grave because you won't have a chance to do it, right? It's, that's not it. Um, you cannot, however, pick your spot very far in advance. I helped start a natural burial ground in Essex, New York, which is just across the lake on the Charlotte Ferry. This is a meadow that's reforesting. And a gentleman bought his grave, and he came back three years later, and there were white pines coming up. White pines colonize meadows and help start forests. This is what we want to have happen in the cemetery. He, however, did not want to have white pines at his gravesite. <laughs> Forest change. So when death is imminent, uh, so about six months before death occurs, which is when you can go on hospice, and I encourage everybody to please go on hospice as early as possible. Um, those services are incredible for your families. The average stay on hospice in Vermont is 72 hours. You can get a whole six months of support at home. Um, so when, when, when death is imminent, when six months is, you know, within six months, people can come and pick their spots. We've had people do that. Uh, we've also had family members come and pick spots um, on the behalf of a person who is either dying or has died. And we also will pick spots when we're informed by people. So um, this winter, we got a call from a gentleman that was dying in Massachusetts. He dreamt he became a shepherd in the Green Mountains. Our land was farmed, and at one point, like most of Vermont farms, did have sheep. So I said, we can bury him in our sheepfold, and she was delighted by this. And uh, we were walking around in the cemetery. My, my husband, who you saw, he was the guy in the funny hat in the like, early scene of the documentary. He's the sexton at the cemetery, so he does most of the digging and the practical side of things. And we were standing on a hill, and we realized that before all the trees had grown up, that's exactly where a shepherd would have stood to watch all of the sheep. So that's, that's his site. So that's where we buried our shepherd. So that's how that all works. Yes? So the question is, how long do bodies take to break down underground? And the answer to that, I wish I could give you an exact answer. And I'm not trying to avoid the question. It's just there isn't an exact answer. It depends on the body. It depends on the soil. It depends on the time of year. It depends on how wet it's been and how cold it's been. The rate of decomposition is largely regulated by the needs of the forest. Burials that we do in the winter and in the fall are going to take longer to break down than burials we do in the spring and the summer. There's a much higher demand for nutrients in spring and summer. I tell everybody that we bury in the fall and the winter, come back in the spring, because leaf out will be fueled by the body of the person that you love. This is the way that they're going to love you back in the spring, is by showing all these leaves into, into nature. So, in general, we can say soft tissue decomposes once we bury it on the order of weeks to months, ligaments and small bones on the order of months to years, larger bones, years to eternity. Archaeology exists because there are some situations in which bones just do not break down. In terms of reusing graves, my mom's family comes from Poland, where grave reuse is quite common. There's three things that happen in Poland. One is they press whatever bones are left back down into the soil, add a little layer of soil on top, and just put the next body right in. The other is, and this is a very Catholic tradition, they take the bones out and they put them, depending on how wealthy you are, in either a common ossuary, which is just a fancy word for box of bones, or you can get your own individual little ossuary. And this is a bit like relics for those of you that have gone to Europe and looked at saints' relics and things like that. So you can become a relic in a church. <laughs> Um, we will not be removing bones from graves. Um, in Greece, they actually break the bones up with little hammers um, after burial. So these traditions depend on, on culture and country. We don't have these in this country and in our cultures. So are, we will be looking at something of uh, adding additional soil on top of any bones that remain. But this is part of why we need to do some experiments first and look at what a reasonable timeline is. I expect it would be at least 20 years um, before we're ready to reuse a gravesite.
Yes. Yes. I live in Burlington, and I've looked into uh, donating my body to the UVM. It's complicated. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, there's absolutely no guarantee that my body would be accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be delivered to them within 60 hours, I think it is. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I have a very small family, and my wife is not interested in disposing of my body. <laughs> uh, so I would have to deal with a film director to offer my body to UVM. If UVM accepts it, then uh, two or three years later, uh, after it's cremated, uh, the cremains would be returned to us, and we could bury the cremains at your cemetery. Uh, if my body is not accepted, I have to get the body out of there uh, right away, because they don't want it. <laughs> uh, and uh, how would the mechanics of transporting the body, if my family is not willing or able to do it, uh, uh, are there film directors? Uh, I mean, I could deal with a film director in Burlington to transfer my body to UVM, but if UVM does not accept it, how do I get it from there here to here? Yes. So, um, so this is a question about, but there's a couple ways to answer this question, but the, the specifics of this question is, the truth of the matter is that if you can donate your body to science, it depends on whether or not science needs your body at the time that you die. Um, during COVID, there were a lot of bodies coming into research institutions. Um, there was an over amount of bodies based on need, so bodies were returned to families. So in that case, how does a body get, so if it's not gonna be used to science, if you're not getting cremated remains back to the family, what happens? You can hire a funeral director to bring the body back to the cemetery. Um, to, yes, to us, to any other cemetery, um, to your own land if you wanted to be buried on your own land. The cost to consider with this is that, so you live in Burlington. So funeral homes have, you, most funeral homes have a radius in which they do not charge for transport. It's usually 30 or 50 miles uh, from the funeral home itself. And then over that, there's a, there's a charge. So if you're in Burlington, you hire a Burlington funeral home, and there's a couple that we work with that I would recommend to you in this case. Um, they would not have a charge for picking your body up from UVM. They would have a charge for bringing you down to the cemetery. The funeral home we work with most often is in Randolph. They would have a charge for picking you up from UVM, but they would not have a charge <laughs> for bringing you to a cemetery. So this is an interesting thing of, is, is to price shop. Um, if finances are a concern, they are for most of us, look at what is going to be the most reasonable, which funeral home is the most open and amenable to these ideas. Um, so that's something that, and again, we work with some, so I can give recommendations as to funeral homes that you can work with that are familiar and, and um, open and accessible um, to families and willing to come uh, out to our, our cemetery. Um, and there's a couple that won't, unfortunately. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this story to, to answer a question that hasn't been asked yet, which is what about organ donation or tissue donation after death? Um, so neither of those are incompatible with natural burial. However, most organs age out at about 62 to 65 years. Not because they're not good anymore, but because the system just doesn't want to deal with the testing. Oftentimes people start taking medications that can, anyways. We need organs, we still limit how many organs can go into supply. So over 62, the chances of being an organ donor go way down. The other thing about organ donation is that you basically have to die in the hospital because your body is hooked up to life support machines so that oxygen and blood continues to perfuse those organs until they can be removed and transported to the person that needs them. 
what remains an option for most people is tissue donation. And this is when we take skin from the body, ligaments, bones, and corneas from the eyes, and those can go into donation. That's much less restrictive. There's very little age restrictions. There's much less restrictions on the amount of you know, types of medication that you're taking for this. It's a wonderful thing to do for people. It just means that there's a little bit more work in preparing the body for natural burial. And I have done this with family members. I've had family members decide that it's too much and they'd rather have me just do it for them or they've hired a funeral director from a conventional funeral home to do that for them. So if you want to be an organ or I keep hitting the off button. <laughs> if you want to be an organ or a tissue donor, you can still have a natural burial. But with all things, it is best to plan in advance for this and make sure that people are prepared for the body care that's involved. Most conventional funeral homes use plastic when they prepare a body after donation, and that is not consistent with natural burial. So make sure that you work with a funeral home that understands what those restrictions are. Yes? What's the average cost of a natural burial? So I can't tell you what the average is statewide at this point because there's too many cemeteries to keep track of, but for us, so the way that our costs work, if you buy a grave at a cemetery, the grave has one cost and the burial service has another. Most cemeteries will charge you up front for the cost of the grave and charge you at the time of for the burial service because that charge changes over time. When I worked at, at Guare's, I had a number of families that were not aware of that price difference. They could not afford the actual burial service fee and they had to resort to cremation instead of burial at the time of death. So we charge, it's a separate fee, but we charge it up front. So the cost of a lot at Vermont Forest Cemetery is $1,000. My goal is for that to never change. The burial service cost at, at Vermont Forest Cemetery starts at $1,400, and that is if you have at least three family members that can participate in, in the burial process itself. If you need more people and we're calling on more of our volunteers, that cost goes up to $2,500. Um, there's also surcharges for winter, um, we know you can't help it if you die in the winter. However, we also can't help it that it's harder to do the burial in the winter. So there is a small surcharge for that, and there is a weekend surcharge. If you buy your grave in advance, what we charge you is twenty-four twenty. So that's the one thousand for the lot, the fourteen hundred for the burial service fee, and the twenty dollars is what the town of Roxbury charges us to record the information. We don't upcharge that, but we do pass that on to you. Um, again, I hate the money thing. We do have price lists here, so don't feel like you have to memorize it. Um, and, and it is all on our website as well. Oh my goodness, how are we doing with time? Um, uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. Okay, <laughs> all right, I wanna take questions from people that haven't had a chance to. The question is, what can you be buried in? I think maybe the batteries are going. I don't know. It's not all me. Um, so we ask that whatever you're buried in be um, organic, uh, natural material, something that's going to biodegrade. Um, so, but we don't check tags. We, we balance the needs of mourners. It probably is the batteries yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We balance the needs of the forest against the needs of the mourners. So if you want to be buried in a family quilt and you don't know if it's got polyester fill or something else, we're not going to cut it open and look into it and send you back home if somebody comes in that. Right? Um, but we do ask, we just had this, and this was on me. Uh, a gentleman built the casket for his wife. I talked to him about dimension. I encouraged him to include handles. I did not mention that it should be made of pine because I thought that was the obvious. He built it out of one inch maple. It weighed about 200 pounds and it will not easily return to the forest. It was gorgeous and it was an act of love for his wife. I did not tell him that we were not going to be able to bury that. We just got some extra strong volunteers to come out and help us with that one. Um, so, but yes, so a shroud can be any, any fabric. It can be a sheet. It can be a family quilt. We work with a woman, uh, Jan Stewart, here in Montpelier that felts them from llama wool and she'll customize them for you. Um, but there's the only restriction that we ask is as much as possible natural organic materials that are going to be easily returned to the forest so that your body can also return to the forest. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to do quite so much work. Um, yes? 
is it possible to see the documentary at home or share it with others? So right now, this documentary was a student documentary, and they are entering it into film competitions. So the only way to see it is to have one of our screenings and come out. If you want to show it to other people, I have been traveling around the state all of this uh, year, bringing it to communities. We do it at no cost to you. I waive my speaker fee for this. Um, I will be out of commission uh, <laughs> for a couple of months, but we do have board members that will bring it around this winter. And um, as long as you don't mind me showing up with a baby, I'll be back doing this again in the spring. So that's the way to see it again. Um, and I should add to the website a list of film festivals where it's being shown for people that want to see it. I'll take one, one more. Sure. One more question. All right, in the back. Um, I, I didn't notice, and maybe there hasn't been enough time for having people buried together, like uh, mm. couples. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how, how far apart do they, be? I mean, just tell me a little bit how yeah. that would work. So this is the question about adjacent burials and couple burials. And so this is the exception to you can't pick your spot. If you are a part of a family unit and someone dies first and that spot is selected, then we will hold the spots around them for you. Um, they are not always contiguous. Sometimes there are trees or something in the way. That rule, we have burial density, about 100 bodies per acre, means the plot that we sell you is about 10 by 10, the grave we dig to the dimensions of the body. This is to disturb as little of the forest as possible, but also to create as little work as possible on the other side of it. So it's about a 10 by 10 lot, um, and then we just work to site the adjacent grave to make sure that we're far away enough. And that's why that, that bronze pin in our metal detector, then we know exactly where in that 10 by 10 lot that grave is, and we can make sure we're several feet over so that when we take the adjacent grave, we don't collapse the grave next to it. But we absolutely do allow for people to be buried together. Uh, we have sold a number of now burial sites where one member of the couple has died and their partner will be buried next to them. We also have one, excuse me, we have one where the entire family, so we have four lots that were sold. We also do pet burials, so we have had somebody buy a grave and then buy a grave for their dog. Um, we just ask for pet burials. Please don't euthanize your pet at the time that you die. We will work with you to make arrangements to make sure that they get buried next to you and they can live out a long and natural and happy, healthy life. Um, but does that, yeah, all right. And did you want to ask your question? Yes, suppose you have metal and plastic deposits. Oh, and oh. Yep. So, this is the question about implants and what do we put in, what do we put in the ground? So, for the most part, if it is safe to put in your body, it is not going to disturb soil. So artificial joints and things like that, we do not, first of all, they, they're surgically implanted. It's a lot of work to remove them, right? We're not going to remove them before burial. So artificial joints, all of that, they go down into the ground. Something that comes out on the surface, a pacemaker has batteries, um, a port, um, or something like that, an a insulin pump. Those we will remove um, prior to burial. Um, and I can, you know, again, if you're doing this at home, your family can do it, a funeral director does it for you. All of these are things that are also removed prior to cremation, so this is not new for anybody. Why are we not worried about things going into the soil? Again, if it's in your body, if it doesn't harm your body, it's not gonna necessarily harm the soil. But the other thing is that soil, it, if it can't break something down, it, there's a process called chelation. It fixes it in place. And we are a very murder-obsessed culture. Have you guys heard of body farms? Um, there are whole forensic research institutes that have studied what happens and how things migrate away from bodies after death. They move about 10 millimeters. So we don't worry about that metal is, and, or ceramic is going to take a long time to break down underneath the soil. When it does, those parts that the soil can't reuse and can't digest, it's going to fix into place. All our graves are reasonably sited from water per state statute, so we don't worry about any of that getting anywhere far away from the grave. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.